in to the CHGO White Sox post-game show. Coming to you live from Studio B of our CHGO offices here in the rainy West Loop of Chicago. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Alongside me is Herb Lawrence. Hello. You can follow him at Eckerwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. You can follow the show at CHGO underscore White Sox. We're being produced today by Sarah. Hello. And we are coming to you. Hello, Sarah. We are coming to you live mm. after the fourth straight <laughs> White Sox loss to start the 2024 season. They lose nine to nothing in eight innings. We saw two rain delays in the final one. They just said, we don't need to see how this plays <laughs> out. We know how the first eight innings went. Sox are 0 and 4. Herb, how are you feeling? I mean, I knew this was going to happen, and worse is coming down the pike because you just lost to Charlie Morton, who was not good um, for the most part. He was leaving fat balls, uh, fat balls, and he was walking the yard and hitting people early in the game, and the White Sox never took advantage of him. And now you got Raylo on the bump tomorrow looking for a redemption arc, and then you got one of the best pitchers in baseball and Spencer Strider towing the rubber on Wednesday for the Braves, so... The offense of the Braves is already scary. Their starting pitching, equally scary. So, and the White Sox bugaboo, even though you go against Charlie Morton, who's fine, he gives you 30 starts a year, and you get nothing? Imagine when you get actual better pitchers going to the bump these next couple of days. And I'm sure Rinaldo Lopez wants to teach the White Sox to say, hey, these people had faith in me. This is one of the best teams in the National League, and they have faith in me to put me in the ro- rotation. You guys took me out of the rotation after I struggled a little bit early in my career. I'm going to try to shove this up your giggies. I would love to see it. Hey, I'd just love to see any interesting baseball, even if it's by the other team. Any Anything that's better than the White Sox not scoring a single run. Did they get somebody past second base today? Like, past second base. Like, was there a runner on third base? Yeah, I yeah because they had bases loaded in the first inning. Oh, yeah, there was bases loaded in the third inning. Uh, they, and they, they weren't able to capitalize. Paul DeYoung struck out. Um, so, okay, they... Small victories, silver linings. They got somebody to third today. Yay! So, yay! Uh, our guy tomorrow Matt- will try shapes. Yes. And then we'll do the alphabet. <laughs> and maybe we'll get colors at some point. Uh, Matt from Oakland in the comments saying, four games, take it easy, guys. Uh, make sure you're hitting the like button. Make sure you're subscribing. Uh, we'd appreciate you guys uh, hanging out and giving your White Sox thoughts. I guess the issue with at least the four games, take it easy, is in three of those games, they've scored two runs or less. And hey, it wasn't a one-run loss today. They just, you know, got demolished by a great baseball team that I think every player in the lineup by the sixth inning had a hit. Yes. And yeah, that wasn't the case for the White Sox. I mean, I I think that will probably take until July until the White Sox have every single person have a hit. I mean, are you talking about so every person has at least one hit on the season? That'll take them to July, or you mean actual one game that the White Sox will have one through nine actually have one hit? I don't know if that's going to happen this year. We got people like Dominic Fletcher in the lineup. He got a hit today. Congratulations to him. Nicky Lopez, even though it's my man's, can't hit. Local guy. Paul DeYoung, can't hit. He has a bomb. You're naming all the guys at the bottom of the lineup. Why don't you name the guys at the top of the lineup? They can't hit either. Andrew, what, Bennett, Andrew Bennett, 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 Andrew Vaughn drew a walk today. Hey, there we go. He laid off some cutting balls. I actually from think Morton. that the results of Andrew Vaughn's things haven't gone well, but I think he's had better at bats than he had last yeah. year in the four game sample, which is small. But I'm not too hard on him. Um, my guy had a great game, though. My guy, Yohan Mankata. Let's go. Double, single, Your guy. line shot, and then he walked later on? Hmm, my man. Look at you go on Moncada, Arthur Eddie. Winning me a click to pick early in the year. There you go. Hey, maybe we shouldn't bury the lead. Uh, you won our first pick to click? What, um, what is going on? Can you update people through the four games? Because they haven't won. So do somebody does, does somebody still win the contest? Yes. Even if they are horrible and don't score any runs and do nothing offensively? Yes. Okay. Now... If one of our four players, it's me, Sean, Vinny, and then a diehard member who pick our p- clicks to pick before the game. I rank them one to nine be- between the number one would be the most successful person we think is going to happen, which is Luis Robert every game, and the least successful, which usually is like Dominic Fletcher or Nicky Lopez, and putting point values next to their name. I picked Yohan Moncada today. He had two points next to his name. I get two points. The other day when um, Luis Robert hit that two home runs, he only had one point 
to his name. Our guy Jared in the Discord gets one point. So I have two points. Jared has one point. Vinny and Sean have zero so far in the click to pick. We're going into this Sunday, and then we'll pick a new person to join us next week. So if you want to become a diehard, check out allchgo.com. You get a shirt of your choice when you sign up. You get a nice box that includes a membership card, some stickers, and you get access to the CHGO Discord where you get to chat with White Sox fans alike. And hey, Herb's pointing to the shirt. We do have some new shirts for opening day. We got the Defend the South Side one and the Sunday Fun Day one. And uh, hey, look, we actually got the uh, physical product here as well. So Herb's got the shirt on, the black one on, and here's here's the white one. Uh, a little Sunday Fun Day there. If you're going to the the ballpark on a Sunday, it's a nice shirt to pick up. And uh, it's got some cool, like, flecking uh, t- to it as well. Um, it, it's It's got a nice little design to yeah. it. Uh, real, real fun that it's not just, you know, this plain uh, graphic, right? There's some texture to it. Yeah, and I I love this shirt. It feels good, nice and comfortable, and I like the uh, the up. barbed wire bats over there. It reminds me a little bit of Negan. Pardon? Negan. Oh God, the Walking Dead. That's what I thought, too. Yeah. Oh, I've never seen that show. Oh, great show. Yeah, Check he some pretty pretty gruesome scenes with that one. Oh, man. That's when ne- Negan took over the show and made the show good in the middle of it. It was crap like from, the, like, four to six, and then Negan took over in the seventh season. It's like killed off most of my favorite characters, too, but mm-hmm. other than that. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, Matt McCory saying, who would want to watch this? Hey, don't worry. We got people watching. Hit that thumbs up button. Uh, and McFly guy saying, zero points. Who do you guys think you are? The White Sox lineup? <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, my guy, Nicky Lopez. He was doing his best. He was trying to steal a bag out there. <laughs> Just c- couldn't happen. Um, yeah, no, your point to Vaughn, that at bat, especially against Morton, looked great. The biggest thing against uh, him versus righties is pitches on the outer edge of the plate going towards that left-handed batter's box. A lot of breaking pitches he struggled against last year and was able to draw a walk. We wanted to talk about that. We talked about that all, all this offseason. Yep. You know, the growth for Andrew Vaughn getting on base, seeing that play discipline and that ability to walk showed a little bit today. And you bring up Moncada. Hey, you congrats. Congrats to you. There you go. Uh, you win the click to pick. Uh, Yohan Makata had a pretty good day. Mm-hmm. Pretty, pretty good day. Uh, a single that then turned into a double because it caromed off the sidewall a little funky. Hustled into second. Got a double. That's his third extra base hit of the year. And honestly, that's the third extra base hit that he's hustled for. He hustled for a triple. That easily could have been a double from uh, Mankata in 2023. He looks healthy and fiery all, to get all the way to third uh, in that Detroit series. There was another double as well that he got to second base and made sure that he was hustling to second base. And it was the same thing today as well. And he made some great defensive plays as well. There was the one he charged up. I think Harris was the runner, was able to barely get Harris uh, at first base. It was a nice play there. There was the threat uh, uh, that he ended up uh, neutralizing, uh, you know, making that play deep in the hole, throwing that runner out at first. Filthy. And then there was also the play in foul territory where he ran down and got it. So Mancata looks great. Robert had a tough day today. Uh, I think that's the only other part player-wise that I want to bring up. We'll talk a little bit about flexing later. And we'll talk about the newest White Sox. I don't know how new he is to you guys. You guys definitely know him. Uh, but uh, Robert today struggled a lot, had some strikeouts, and it seemed like he was trying – to be patient, but Charlie Morton was like, well, if this guy's going to be patient, I'm going to throw fastballs. And we saw this with Morton. We saw it even with Matt Zek. Uh, Luis Robert Jr. being laid on like 93-mile-per-hour fastballs. Yeah. Uh, just just odd for him specifically. I don't know if it was the weather that kind of took out his uh, his lust for baseball, his ability to destroy balls, but uh, he did not look like the same guy hitting two homers off Kenta Maeda going into you know 18 pitches from and seeing 18 pitches from Maeda. And that's the thing with Luis Robert Jr. Like, to be a superstar, consistency has to be the thing. And I know the weather's inclement, and he's probably not used to this weather being grown up in Cuba where it's a little bit more hot every day. But that's that's what you want. If you want to be and take that next step to be just a star on the White Sox, to be superstar and get that real contract in four years, consistency needs to be there. We're talking about you lauding the the – Patience you had at the place, what you did in the offseason, working the quadrants so you can have good swing decisions. Today, there were some bad swing decisions all day long. He struck out a couple times yesterday, three times, where we thought that those strikeouts, you know, for the most part, he battled in those uh, strikeouts. Mm-hmm. And a couple of those, the umpire took the strike or the walk that he had earned away from him. Today was the opposite of that, where he just looked bad at the plate, looked lost. And Charlie Morton, like I said, 
the numbers will say different because he didn't give up a run, but also take that with a grain of salt because it's the White Sox. And he, Luis Robert Jr., looked lost today, and he was swinging at balls that were not close to the plate, not even, like, enticing, never strikes. There was one strikeout he had that the ball was kind of at the outside of the strike zone, and then it just fell off into the batter's box, and he just flailed at it. It was just weird. 12 swings from Robert today, six swings and misses, so not great uh, from Luis Robert Jr. We did see Chris Flexen's first White Sox start. We'll talk about that a little bit later on, and we will also talk about, again, the newest Chicago White Sox. But we do want to let you know about our friends over at Price Picks. We also want to let you know about our friends over at uh, Factor. My bad. Uh, Factor meals are fantastic. We've been... Uh, really helping out our lunch. It's been easy to plan for lunches Mm -hmm. with the Factor Meal Kits coming over. So thank you to Factor Meal. This show is presented by Factor Meal Kits. Uh, Head over to factormeals.com slash C-H-G-O-S-O-X-5-0 and insert code C-H-G-O-S-O-X-5-0 to get 50% off. That's code C-H-G-O-S-O-X-5-0 at factormeals.com slash C-H-G-O-S-O-X-5-0 to get 50% off. And we also want to let you know about our friends over at Prize picks. Uh, Prize picks is great for not only all the basketball action that's happening. You got some college, both on the men's and women's side. You got the NBA, but obviously the MLB's season has kicked off. Prize picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, and they're the easy and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers, and instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in probably an easy play tomorrow to just take every single brave player to get a hit again i mean hey there you go you could have you could have nine times your money i think well it's two to six so you could oh, yeah. six times your money with, with prize picks today and just Braves. leave out the three braves you don't think they're gonna hit, get a hit oh no kelnick's gonna get a hit today neither is arcia so let me leave them off and maybe even the catcher uh was it uh uh travis darno, darno now yeah. i forgot it's not a the, the booty of uh, Sean, Sean Murphy. Murphy as he hit the IL. Now, then, hey, the White Sox got to even, uh, I mean, imagine if Sean Murphy was in the lineup. Probably would have been 15 <laughs> nothing. Uh, but uh, you are going to be a winner with our friends over at Prize Picks. They offer insurance injuries so that if your entries, uh, th- so that your entries stay in play, even if one of your players get injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return to the second, the player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays alive. And it's really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds so go check out the fun at prizepicks.com slash chgo and use code chgo uh, chgo for first time deposit match up to 100 dollars. that's prizepicks.com slash chgo and use code chgo pick more pick less it's that easy game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace for major league baseball which means you're getting the tickets even faster and easier Prices on Game Time app actually will go down closer it gets to the first pitch. And with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. I went down to Atlanta a couple years ago, and and I can give a recent story. I actually bought tickets for a Milwaukee game at the end of this month, April, where we're going to go up to Milwaukee to see them play the Yankees. Of course, I bought them on uh, Game Time. I did a zone deal where I got. Tickets for like, I think $88 each where those tickets are supposed to be $130 each. So price, I mean, I'm price picks. Game time always has me hooked up. But my Atlanta story is I went to Atlanta, see the Braves, got tickets on game time, went to all the rest of the secondary markets after that to see if there was a price lower in the section and row that I was in. There happened to be one. And I sent this information to Game Time. They sent me the difference, 110% of the difference, in my account within 12 minutes. You can save up to 60% by buying last minute on sports, co- concerts, comedy, theater, etc. Save even more with app exclusive deals like uh, selecting your seats ahead of the game or the event. And with zone deals like I just got in Milwaukee, save even more when you choose a section and let Game Time choose the seats, an uh, average of 18% each time you do it. Get a panoramic view from your seat before you buy. If you've ever been to a stadium with obstructed views, you know this feature is clutch. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. For a limited time, all users can get $20 off an MLB purchase of $150 or more in the game time app with the code FIRSTPITCH. Terms apply. That's code F-I-R-S-T-P-I-T-C-H for $20 off from March 25th to April 14th only. 
Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. And we got 102 people watching. All right. So if you say that White Sox fans don't care, uh, if you ever hear that, clearly there are 102 people that at least click care. And, and the fact only... that we're over 100 is impressive. Like for 102 team. people watching a 101 lost team from last year that lost their fourth game to start the season, and then they just signed some dirt bag again. Well, I was trying to literally wait until the last minute possible. Maybe I'm even sorry. until Vinny. Maybe we could just wait until Vinny comes on. Does and we could blame, Maybe we could just blame Vinny. I, I bet <laughs> Vinny knows. Um but, yeah, no, I mean, 102 people watching, and there, it's a 101-loss team. We have more viewers than losses, and honestly, that's surprising. <laughs> hey, uh, this year, they're like, hey, we're going to try to beat that out. Yeah, we appreciate Jeezy saying, like Spike. If you guys haven't liked yet, appreciate the like. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, Justin Wheel, or Weil, I don't know how to say that. What's the deal with the new draft rules? Can we even get the first pick? So, the White Sox, in the 2024 draft, will have the fifth overall pick. And because of their spending, because of their market, funny enough, yeah, their market size, but even just the amount that they've spent, they are not able to get a top 10 pick in back-to-back years. So in 2025, if this team loses 100 games and they are the worst team in baseball, they are not guaranteed to get a top 10 pick. They cannot get back-to-back top 10 picks. Uh, So they'll have one in 2024. They have one already. But in 2025, they will not have one. So the White Sox have all the incentive in the world this year in 2024 to win. Yes. They're 0-4. Yeah. And, and they're, they're horrible. <laughs> they're horrible, 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 horrible. They have just untalented. I I, I don't know. I, I can't. I can't. I, I know you're mad. I don't want to blame the people that much. I don't even want to blame the 26 guys that much. It's not their fault that these are the selection of 26 men. And hey, now it's 27 because Chris Getz went out and decided, thanks to Robert Murray for this report of fan sided, that Mike Clevenger is now a White Sox. So this collection of 27 men is really the fault of the front office and the owners. The fact that this team is so bad and the fact that they're bringing in this person, Mike Clevenger, to quote-unquote help the team is just more of anything a sign of just how frustrating it is to be a White Sox fan and how frustrating it is to have this person as our owner leading down the chain to the general manager because hey he knew all the people that were available for general managers he knew all the people in, Ma- uh, in major league baseball he didn't have to do all the interviews he knew chris getz can turn around the fastest and uh they're zero and four right yeah under chris getz yeah and i see jeff's comment pat finley saying that the team is so dislikable already it doesn't hurt to sign clever it does i no, you can't trade him at the deadline because they tried to do that last year no one wanted him Every single major league team had the ability to sign Mike Clevenger after October's uh, the season ended in October of 2023. No one did. And two, he had a 3.47 ERA at the end of August. You might say he missed all of July, so that's why he wasn't traded at the trade deadline last year. They put his ass on waivers. If any team wanted to have Mike Clevenger last year, All they had to do was put in a waiver claim. And he wore a White Sox jersey for all of 2023. And his ass will be wearing a White Sox uniform for all of 2024. This is the problem I have with the Mike Clevenger thing. You talk all offseason about culture. You talk all offseason about getting rid of the bad culture guys. The clubhouse cancer dudes there and. I thought he would be part of that. I mean, the guy was surly. The guy was kind of dickish. And we're not even talking about the allegations against him from his former, um, still his baby's mama. Um, We haven't talked about those allegations, but why bring on such an unlikable guy where most of your fans do not like him? Most of them already actively do not like the person. Why do this? What's where's the where are you getting anything for your team? Where's the goodwill you're getting from this signing? Like even if he pitches as well as he pitched last year, what does that mean? He's just on the team, on a bad team like he was last year. Like you're just inflaming the fans who don't want to be fans of this team anymore to just go away. To just leave because you're just signing D-bags and bad people that they hate. 
if you're going to do this, sign somebody that actually can be helpful. Maybe Zach Grinky wants a little extra. Even hell, Brad Keller, would. he's on the team right now. He's in AAA. I would have taken Brad Keller being a fifth starter or a spot starter over Mike Clevenger. There's no way to get this guy on this team. There was no reason to get this guy on this team. And so whatever Chris Getz is saying and all the goodwill he built up from his first offseason, to me, it's gone. There's nothing there where you're like, oh, yeah, that was a good signing from getting Mike Clevenger. I don't care what he does with the White Sox. They're not going to win, and he's not going to help them go over the record that they're supposed to be at. And Matt's saying Clevenger had a good season last year, so what's the harm? What is the harm then? You know, I mean, what is the harm? Why are the White Sox the only person that wants to fucking employ this guy? Huh? Did you, does that ring through your fucking head? Like, why are the White Sox the only team that wants to sign Mike Clevenger? He's got a 127 career ERA plus. Teams are looking for starting pitching. Starting pitchers get hurt all the damn time. Why aren't the Yankees signing him? Their, their Cy Young just went down, huh? I mean, this is four games into the season, and they decide to do this. This isn't even for Thursday no. when they need a fifth starter. No. They're going to need to call somebody up to be the fifth starter regardless. Like, you didn't even help out your team enough. If you were going to do this, then just fucking do it in March. Like, why are you waiting so long for this to happen? If he was so good last year, why are the White Sox the only ones? The only ones to sign him. No one picked him up on waivers. No one traded for him. He had a 4.77 ERA. He was a top 40 free agent in Major League Baseball. No one else signed him. He waited until the regular season started, hoping someone else would sign him. The White Sox are the only team interested in signing him. It's bullshit. The guy... A is a clubhouse cancer. Prove that in Cleveland. Prove that in San Diego. And people didn't want him around. And no. you brought up the culture, 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 culture. We have to watch Martin Maldonado be unable to block a ball because of culture. Mike Clevenger better go out and have a two ERA for culture's sake. Well, yeah, you never see me this mad, White Sox Tom, because it's fucking bullshit. We're watching a horrible White Sox team that might not even win 60 games, and I have to go watch an asshat pitch for them. And I try to root for them every single game. Every single game, I hope the White Sox win. And last year, it was a struggle to watch Mike Clevenger pitch and try to balance as a fan, do I want the White Sox to win and have Mike Clevenger contribute to White Sox success? Or would I rather have Mike Clevenger, a person that clearly is a bad person, and Major League Baseball thinks that he's a bad person, do I want him to just have a bad outing and the White Sox lose? I didn't have to deal with that in 2024. I was already dealing with fucking Paul DeYoung and Martin Maldonado and Max Stassi and Dominic Fletcher and who's the guy that they cut right before the season? Oh, Kevin Pillar, right? We were already dealing with enough crap on this team and none of those guys were bad people. Nope. None of those guys after they were signed were being investigated by Major League Baseball for a domestic violence claim. And yes, he didn't face any discipline. Great. Congratulations. You could bring that up. He also was told to go to therapy yes like for and anger this. management and yeah. anger management for this like he needed to be counseled as a human to be a better person and he went through all that work and no one signed him except the white Sox. except tells you, the white Sox. tells you all you need to know a hundred percent what you know need to know sean just killed it right there i cannot add anything else i'm just so pissed at the white Sox that now that they're, they're a team that is just more unlikable. I want them to lose however many games they can lose. Whatever the record is. What is the record, Sean? 125 games I think in it's a season? 46 games. I think the 1964 Mets won in 162 games. I think they won 46. Games. I want them to be so embarrassed that they have to purge everything. Just go. Like Jerry Reinsdorf doesn't want to do this anymore. He sells the team. Chris Getz just leaves. Same thing with Pedro Gafal. Because you can't preach all they preached in the offseason and then do what they have done so far in this season and then punctuate it with signing this jerk. Uh, the 1962 Mets went 40, 120, and 1. But that was like their first season ever. It was their first. That wasn't <laughs> like their first uh, season ever. That was. And, hey, you could say you don't care about his personal affairs. Just pitch. Okay, great. That's great for fucking you. I care. 
And you know who also cares? People who are, A, have been a part of domestic violence before, people who have to deal with scumbags on their daily basis, and this guy gets paid millions of dollars to go put on a uniform that's poorly made by fanatics, but usually a uniform that has some respect to it, some... Again, you're talking about culture. They're talking about fixing the culture of this White Sox team. Even if he goes out and, again, has a two ERA, how is he helping the culture? How is he helping the 2024 White Sox? What? He's going to be the winning pitcher. He won nine games last year. So he's going to he's gonna maybe contribute. Maybe. He went nine to nine. Maybe he's going to go and contribute nine wins to the White Sox. Where does this raise their ceiling from? Does 55 it? wins to 57 wins? If I'm being nice, I think someone said 60, 61 to 63. Like, no. Like, it's just, it's not... This big of an effect, he had a 3.3 war. People play millions and millions and millions of dollars to sign pitchers who can throw hundreds of innings and give you positive war. Nobody wanted this guy. I don't know. It tells you all you need to know about him, and I got it. You don't care about bad people playing for your team, but it's a bad team. Like, I understand if you had that stance and that this Mike Clevenger move made the White Sox go from also ran to title contender. I don't like it, but I can understand where you can, you know, sacrifice your personal feelings and your integrity for team success. This is both sacrificing your integrity and team or and your personal feelings and no team success. Like, what, what does it do for anybody? It doesn't do anything for anybody except for Mike Clevenger. The White Sox throwing him a life raft, giving him a major league deal. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I, I think it just, it truly just leads to this stuff being accepted. Because there's a name that I have tried to avoid all offseason because all other 30 teams have not signed this guy. And there's people in the chat that consistently bring up that name, the guy that used to play for the Cincinnati Reds and used to play for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Like what you are doing is you are validating and you are giving acceptance to this. I am fine with second chances and everything like that. And if you feel like this is Michael Clevenger's second chance, Congrats to you. But this is his like third or fourth chance. And that's why 29 other teams just don't want to sign the guy. Just don't want to deal with the guy. Just will it be the White Sox problem. Like that, it's, it's, that's it. I mean, it's, I don't even understand how it's actually helping, helping the Sox. No, I, 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 I don't understand. And that's kind of when I went off yesterday where people were talking about how much they dislike Aloy getting hurt and they dislike the person. Like, for whatever you say about Aloy, he's not trying to get hurt. He is not a bad, actively bad person. Yes, he gets hurt often, and that sucks, and you don't want that to happen. Same thing with people bringing up lazy with Yohan Mankata. I, I get these things, and these are the same people who want to sign Bauer and Clevenger for some reason because, I don't know, because they're just, those are the people they know. Those are the, they saw them p- pitch one time, and their name is uh, in front of them. So let's sign these bad people. Bad people don't deserve second chances unless they ask for it. They ask for forgiveness, which Clevenger has not asked for forgiveness. And they show some restitution, and they work to be a better person. You know, I've been watching his former girlfriend, baby's mama. She's not saying that Mike is a better person. She's going off. Every once in a while, saying that Mike's doing this and that and the other stuff. So, yeah, I don't want the guy. I don't want him on my favorite team. And I happen to work this job, so I got to talk about the jerk. But I'm not going to pull any punches and be, you know, conciliatory to people who want to sign him. F him. He sucks. He's a sucks little person. I don't want him to have success on anything, especially not my team. And I hope the White Sox you know, find a partner that wants to trade for him at the deadline, which we saw last year. We saw all this season. No one wants him except for a shitty organization like the White Sox. Also, Clevenger hasn't pitched in 30 games since 2018, has been consistently hurt in every single season. So if you're talking about Aloy getting hurt, Clevenger also known for getting hurt, and he's going to be starting delayed. He won't be having a full spring training, and he'll probably likely have to do some minor league work to get to major league ready. We'll see how his body holds up because he's at 33 years old. It's very likely that they're signing this guy and his body won't even hold up. So this is, this is just a, a, a fantastic signing from the White Sox. And another thing, this is a bad team. So why are you signing veterans to be on this bad team? If you're going to be bad, let the youngsters play. Let Nick Nostridi go out there and get his innings in this year. Let other starters who are young, up and coming, get their starts in instead of that guy who's a jerk. I heard Vinny's chime, so we should probably take a break, mainly for 
our mental health and for our heart rates and let you know about our fantastic sponsors over at Lining Kugel and uh, let you know about how some you can have some fun with CHGO this year. Yeah. Lining Kugel. Nothing says summer like hanging out with your people, whether you're at the ball game like I was the other day at Guaranteed Rate, drinking some summer shandies, or just chilling out with your people at a cookout like summer shandy. It's my favorite drink right here. Mercy. I'm not just saying it because they sponsor us. But every time I go to the ballpark, I'm getting me some Line of Cuckoo Summer Shandy. And I know you're saying, Herb, hey, I know the summer's here, but what do I do in the off season? What do I do when the summer's over? What type of offerings do they have at Line and Cuckoo's for you? I'm glad you asked, brother. They have Liney's Original, Light Lager, Lakeside Cherry, Juicy Peach, Berry Whites, Northwoods Amber, Dark Lager, and so many more. And they also have Honey Vice, which is made with real Wisconsin honey, Sean. So you know it's good. And if you've tried any of the Line and Cuckoo beers, you know it brings the flavor for any occasion that you are celebrating. For over 150 years, Line and Kugel has been combining German brewing traditions with Wisconsin innovation. You don't have to just pick one. Line and Kugel's popular variety packs come with four favorites to try and enjoy. Flavor life simple moments with Line and Kugels, the official craft beer of the Chicago White Sox. Go to liney.com slash CHGO to find delivery options near you. That's L-E-I-N-I-E dot com slash CHGO. Or pick up Line and Kugels pretty much anywhere they sell beer. Line and Kugels, flavor of the moment. Celebrate responsibly the Jacob Line and Google Brewing Company, Chipper Wolf. Oh, yes. yes. And we will be joined from Guaranteed Rate by our CHGO White Sox beat writer, Vinny Duber, in just a second. But we do want to let you know about the Die Hard program and how you, the diehard, can enjoy some Vinny Duber writing, some exclusive Vinny Duber writing. He's got a White Sox weekly post that was published every single Monday. It's our White Sox newsletter letter that comes out every single Monday, and he had an exclusive sit-down with Michael Kopech. So if you saw Michael Kopech throw 16 strikes on 17 pitches, and Filthy. we're like, whoa, what's this man thinking about going to the bullpen? Vinny's got you covered. So uh, sign up to be a diehard today if you haven't already at allchgo.com. Again, you get a shirt of your choice when you sign up. You get a nice box that the shirt comes in that also comes with a membership card, some stickers, and you get access to the CHGO Lounge. That's our Discord uh, Slack where you get to chat with all of the uh, diehards like you. Uh, and we got new diehards like Michael, Taylor, Tim, and Loof. Uh, and I believe Loof is actually just uh, Kevin Kaduk being goofy because it's fool. Full backwards. Yeah. So I, I, I looked at that Robert Murray thing. I'm like, he's a serious reporter. He wouldn't April Fool us, would he? No, well, that's the thing. That's what I was just saying. Is it an April Fool that this is actually happening, or is this our nightmare? Uh, before we go out to Vinny, let's uh, look at some super chats. Oh, but you can become a diehard today at allchgo.com. We also got takeovers uh, happening on uh, May uh, 27th. You can buy a season pass for that. Uh, you also get a shirt. Uh, one of the shirts that we just showed off the Sunday fun day or the shirt that Herb's got on uh, you get, if you do buy a pass for all three takeovers, you also get a shirt as well. Uh, so go check that out. We got games against Toronto, the Dodgers and the Cubs uh, coming up for our takeovers. And if you are diehard, you get 20% off events. Uh, Austin Figueroa with the first $5 super chat. Thank you, Austin. Take my money, Sean. It goes to the pot. We appreciate it. Uh, Jackie saying uh, $5 for Sean's rant. That speaks for a lot of us. Appreciate that. And then Christopher Devine saying, so happy I found that podcast. We're happy that you guys did find this podcast and that we do have a community of White Sox fans that even after this loss, 58 of you are still liking up the video and still commenting and chatting about this team with us. And let's go chat more about this team with our CHGO White Sox beat writer, Vinny Duber. You can follow him at Vinny Duber. Did you have fun in the rain? I am not in the rain, thank goodness. So uh, I did not have fun watching the rain. Uh, as you know, my love of rain delays, but uh, uh, I did have fun not getting rained on. We could say that, sure. And Vinny, I, just for my clearance, um, they banged the game after the eighth inning. Was, was there an explanation why? Because I had a different explanation. I thought they had to have a certain amount of time to have to go pie before they had to bang the game. But why did they bang it right after the eighth inning ended? Uh, it's raining very hard, uh, <laughs> and it has been for some time now. Uh, I don't think it's supposed to stop raining for some time. Uh, there was some confusion, obviously. I think some folks get informed of these types of things ahead of time, and some folks have to wait for the official announcement. I'm in the latter bucket, of course, um, but sometimes, you know, uh, certainly the broadcast partner, uh, as we saw, you know, NBC Sports Chicago go right to their postgame show uh, when that second delay uh, came about. They, they sometimes get a little bit of a heads up. We've got to wait till everything's all official. And so that's why there's probably a little bit of confusion. 
Yeah. Um, where, where do we start? Uh, let's start first with pregame. The White Sox played with 25 men today. Aloy Jimenez was not available. Is there any further word on what Aloy's currently, uh, current situation is? I also heard rumblings that Lenin Sosa might be currently in Chicago as well, but he's not on the 26-man roster. He's on the 40-man, but no moves been made. What's the update? So uh, this morning before the game, Pedro Grafol told us that there was no update on Aloy Jimenez. They were still waiting to get results back from doctor evaluations, and there was they, they didn't know what was going to happen. Did see Lenny and Sosa uh, here at the ballpark today, so he was here in case a roster move needed to be made. But as of yet, that need has not rolled around. Post-game, we asked Pedro, and he said Aloy is day-to-day. So I guess that is a more a slightly more positive outlook than he's got to go, you know, miss all this time. Uh, But they don't exactly know how many days he will be uh, sidelined for. um, And they are playing a man down uh, until they know either that he is going to be sent to the IL or if he gets better and can come back. Uh, I know it's not towards you. And Herb, and Herb, before you ask me why. I'm so mad. Before you ask me why, yes. I will re- I will direct you to the explanations that we heard in the past uh, when these similar sa- si- excuse me similar situations have arisen. Uh, they value Aloy's contributions to the point where they would rather have, you know, they'd rather have uh, him only have to miss four games and play with a man down than have him miss ten games and play without his services for the other six. And that's just an example. Obviously, those aren't actual numbers that have been thrown around in this situation. But that is the thinking. At least that's how it has been explained in the past. I got it, Vinny. I just still think it's dumb as hell. It's one of the dumbest things in the world to play already with a roster that is depleted because you don't have good players on that roster. Now you're playing a man down where you don't have that availability to do that. Imagine, like last night, when Aloy did go out, there was a lefty on the mound, and the only person they had to go as designated hitter was Gavin Sheets, who got struck out immediately. They need people to be either on the on the roster or not. Like this mealy mouth in between, is he going to be out for four games? Is he going to be out for more extended? Should have got off the pot is what I'm saying with them. It's not towards you, Vinny. It's their same situation, and it's not like these things have been working for for them in the past where, man, we got Aloy back in the fourth game. He just immediately murdered. Nothing just happens after this. He's just weak after he comes back, and then he take him slow. We got to take him out for a game because we got to keep his legs fresh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Take, keep his legs fresh by putting him on the IL. Bring Lenny Sosa up. I don't think we'll miss much with Aloy how he's performed in the three games he's played in if he's on this roster or not. You need that extra man. So that's why I'm mad about the White Sox because nothing's changing in the way that they actually handled these injuries and nothing's getting better. Like they're not, the players are not actually progressing by them doing this situation. They're the same players, if not worse. And that's just my thing. I don't. I would think that they would learn through their years of doing this that it's the wrong way to go. It's just frustrating to me that you can be bad, but you can't be bad and ignorant. And I think, in my opinion, they're being ignorant about these injuries and how they handle them. Instead of just putting the man on IL and seeing what he does after 10 days, they just have this thing where he's just going to be in limbo, and the team's in limbo, one player down, just because they don't want to have him an extended period of being out. That's all I got, but no question for me. Just mad. Because it's a, it's a frustrating day, Vinny, because of the guy they signed to. Is there clarity on what Thursday's or whose Thursday starter will be, Vin? Not right now. I can ima- I would imagine that tomorrow there might be more. But uh, remember, this was a situation in which they didn't need the roster spot to be taken up by a starting pitcher until that point. But now here we go. Look at this. This weather, right? I mean, what if they don't play tomorrow? What if they don't play Wednesday? They don't need that fifth starter. And you can kick that can another week down the road, basically. So um, my guess would be they'll wait to find out if they need that, that pitcher or – they see the forecast and they say that that pitcher that we bring up might not go four or five innings anyway. 
let's go ahead and, and just throw a, a, a bullpen pitcher out there to start things off and try to piece together as much as we can. These are guesses. I'm not, I don't have any information from, from the team on this front, but um, it, it, it seems that that player initially was not put on the opening day roster because they got to they, they knew there was going to be a day far in the future when they would finally need him. That day might be fur- farther in the future than they initially anticipated, and so why you know why take away from your bullpen? You got two of your four starting pitchers unable to go five complete innings here in the first turn through the rotation. These guys are obviously needed right now. Why why get rid of a bullpen pitcher if you don't have to? Yeah, and Vinny, I with that point, if they do play the next two games in like they're supposed to with Crochet going tomorrow and then the fifth starter going on Wednesday versus Spencer Strider. <sighs> I just find it like hard to do this to a young player if they do bring up Nick Nostrini. It's kind of like you know teaching him how to drive with a manual transmission on the expressway because the Braves are not anybody's joke. They're going to batter the guy or any pitcher they put out there. And so I would have him in a more of a soft landing and just go with the bullpen game on Wednesday. And those bullpen guys who are more veterans and more established could take the beating a little bit more instead of like a kind of parallel to what Justin Fields had to go through his first start where he got sacked nine times because he wasn't ready to go. I'm not saying necessarily that Nestrini's not ready to go, but also why put him against probably the best hitting team in baseball if you don't need to? Yeah. That's absolutely a a, a very decent thought, and it might end up just kind of working out that way, depending on what happens here with the weather over the next couple days. What was Chris Flexen's reaction to uh, making his first start with the White Sox? Wasn't the best start for Chris Flexen, but I think there was some, you know, silver linings there. Uh, How did Flexen feel after his first start? Uh, you know, not great. You, all these starting pitchers want to go nine innings. You know, uh, you know, uh, let alone let, let alone five. So I think that uh, the fact that he didn't make it deeper is, is certainly eating at him, and he didn't like how things went after that first those first couple innings, which, by the way, were perfect, right? I mean, so um, I think he was pleased by what he showed early in today's uh, start from an efficiency standpoint. And you d- can't get more efficient than putting him down in order two innings in a row. Um, but after that. You know, a few walks um, and the pitch count piled up to a point where they had to take him out before the second out of the fifth inning, which, uh, again, that's something that a starter never wants to have happen. Yeah, and uh, flexing today, the numbers, if you did miss the game, four and two-thirds innings, or four and a third innings pitch, four earned runs, six hits allowed, one K, three walks. Charlie Morton on the other side, five and two-thirds, no earned runs, three hits, six Ks, and two walks. Flexing through six different pitches, a four-seam fastball, a changeup, a cutter, a curveball, a slider, and a sinker. The four-seam fastball was the pitch that he used mostly, and he is mainly a four-seam fastball and changeup guy. 65% of his pitches were that four-seam fastball and changeup, but he was extremely effective an 18 percent called strike plus whiff rate mlb average for a starter is 30 percent and only four whiffs on 34 swings i don't know if i want to judge him too hardly herb though because play the braves it's the braves but the the guy he struck out the first batter he saw <laughs> the reigning a uh mvp and ronald Cunha jr i mean it's a wacky game i was like all right chris flex is gonna be out here as Vinny said the first two innings solid here we go he's out here not even blinking an eye at these Atlanta Braves. And the Braves are like, all right, that's enough. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> they saw him the second time, and they're like, oh, we got this. 91 mile per hour fastball? Uh, all right. Uh, Vinny, we talked a little bit about it, and then we raised our blood pressure, and uh, now we're going to ask you about it. Uh, Robert Murray of Fansided, and then Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic, reporting that the White Sox uh, have signed Michael Clevenger. Is there anything that you want to add? Um, yeah, I'll say this. First of all, from a baseball standpoint, uh, Herb, what you said is what – first came to my mind. This is a bit of a head scratcher when it would seem that the innings that would go to another starting pitcher on this team would be someone that is a part of the long-term picture here. You know, if the idea is not to have this rebuilding project last quite as long as the last one did, then you gotta, you gotta kind of speed it up a little bit. And one thing the White Sox do have is a lot of young starting pitching prospects, one of which, in Nick Nestrini, just had a hell of a spring in which, independent of this move, or or without this move that's being reported, 
maybe would have made the team as the fifth starter and, and gotten a shot and gotten a whole season to get his to get his um, you know development going in that way. Uh, you know they, they rewarded some guys for having a good spring. Garrett Crochet being chief among them, right? Wouldn't Nick Nestrini be uh, in a in line with that kind of thinking and giving him those innings would be valuable to at least at the bare minimum figuring out what you have as you move toward the future. So to bring in a veteran guy where I guess the best case scenario from a baseball standpoint is that he can be flipped at the trade deadline seems a little strange. I mean, this is obviously a team, too, that during the offseason spent in a way that they spent seemingly to save money and to and to try to keep the payroll down and the costs down as they entered into a season in which the outside expectation was that they would not be contenders for much of anything, certainly a playoff spot uh, or a division title. Then there's the other side of this, which I'm sure everybody is talking about, which is this whole idea that Chris Getz wants to revamp the culture here, uh, you know, as he's redoing the whole organization. And what I will say, this is not my opinion. This is what I heard from the team last year. They were very happy with Mike Clevenger as a clubhouse presence last year. I've got a quote here that I'll read from Pedro Grafol. This is September 15th last year. And the question was along the lines of, would you want him back next year? You remember there was a mutual option on that contract that he had last year. And here's what Pedro had to say. I don't see what team wouldn't want a guy like that. A guy that can go out there and compete and compete with plus stuff and have really good makeup and be a real good clubhouse guy with experience. And then he went on to say, from my standpoint, I'd love for him to be a part of the rotation. And I think that is reflective of the performance that Mike Clevenger had last year, which was if not good uh, league-wide, it was certainly the best starting pitching performance over the course of the full season that the White Sox had in 2023. And then you had multiple times the manager of the team talking about what sort of positive presence he was in that clubhouse. Now, fans are going to be unable, most likely, to connect those, or to, I don't know, disconnect those two dots, which was what he was going, uh, what was happening surrounding him during spring training and in the and before the season started, to what the reviews were at the end of the year from the White Sox. Um, what I, I will continue to say, just from a, again, providing context standpoint, the league investigated and decided not to do any, not to do anything, with uh, the exceptions of the things you mentioned, Sean. You know the the uh, uh, suggestions that he uh, participate in some count, uh, counseling esque programs. I don't remember the exact language at the moment, but there is a difference uh, be, uh, that that should be pointed out between him and the player that you brought up alongside his name in Trevor Bauer, who obviously was put on administrative leave for a very long time. Uh, there, there were there were different situations, and, and I'm not creating any defense here. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying that's what happened. And I think it's worth keeping in mind. It's not the same as if they went out and added that player, for example. But even if you put the things that uh, were surrounding Clevenger last year aside, we walked we walked into the season with Rick Hahn, who was then the GM, talking about the calculated risk of taking on a guy who had um, made what he called immature decisions in the past. You remember back to the COVID season when he, uh, you know, broke the bubble and, and went out uh, uh, when they were playing here, actually. So, uh, you know, it, there are things that aren't necessarily that one thing that accompany a, a, a discussion of him uh, in addition to, you know, whatever else is there. But I think there's a, this is a head scratcher from a baseball standpoint. I think from the White Sox perspective, it's less of a head scratcher from a cultural standpoint, but the fans aren't going to think that way and, and they're right to, uh, you know what I mean? This, this is something that happened last year. And so to willingly bring on somebody who, you know, is going to generate that reaction, that's another discussion and different, maybe a different one than the idea of Chris Getz trying to create a certain environment in the clubhouse. And remember, Sean, they paid him $4 million, so just pretty much opt out. Like, hey, here's $8 million during the season, here's $4 million to go somewhere else, and now they got to pay him some more money mm-hmm. for this deal that he's going to have. So I'm not a fan. It's done already, so we bitched about it already. So, you know, only on the starts will we bitch more probably. But, yeah, it's not a good day to be a White Sox uh, fan or to actually be on the White Sox. I'm sure that they're 
not even about the Mike Clevenger thing, but starting 0-4 and, and then today, you know, after a bunch of one-run losses, so you can be kind of heartened by, you know, being close to the Tigers and competing. Today was just a blowout. So did Pedro speak about how he feels about just not competing today? It was just a... Uh, a thrashing from A to B or A to Z, and they didn't compete except for Yoan Moncada, who had kind of had a good game. Yeah, um, you know, Pedro not happy. Obviously, that's uh, it probably goes without saying. But you know, he he did describe one of as this as one of those ones that you just gotta you know, get put right behind you. And certainly that is true. Um, But we'll see how many of those days the White Sox have this year because they had a lot of them last year. You'll remember as well. Um, Listen, this offense does not look very good right now. You know, obviously it was raining. You're playing the Braves. Okay, fine. But uh, I mean, we, I, I talked about it yesterday, the stat from the, from the first series against Detroit, where I think they only had four hits after the fourth inning in those first three games today, another zero in that department. They, they were hitless after Yuan Moncada's double to lead off the third inning. Uh, and, and they, they struck out 10 times. Luis Robert Jr. struck out four times um, after striking out three times looking yesterday. So it, it, the offense looks um, about as ineffective as I think the worst case scenario predictions were from from the preseason and obviously there were a lot of those right I think we all were among those who didn't think that this team was going to find it easy to score runs but in three games or in four games rather um they they've had only few fleeting moments of being able to do much of anything offensively obviously had the bases loaded I believe it was in the first inning today um and you had Paul DeYoung strike out with 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 two outs and 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 the bases loaded but uh you know that's that that moment right there looks like an offensive, uh, you know, supercharge compared to what they did the rest of the day. So um, they need to, they, this is going to be a very long season if this is going to be the norm from them offensively, which I think a lot of folks were afraid was going to be the case. We have 181 people watching, which is surprising for a team that's 0-4 and just, 0 and 4 and just lost 9 nothing to the Braves. Uh, we got 74 likes, so if you haven't liked the video yet, uh, please give us a thumbs up on the stream. We w- really would appreciate it. Uh, the only thing that my mind is on is this Clevenger thing. And I don't know, you bring up the calculated risk comment from Han, and Kevin's right that the situation with the former Cy Young and Clevenger are apples to oranges. MLB didn't suspend uh, Clevenger, they suspended the other guy, right? Uh, I mean, Clevenger played last year. The other guy hasn't played in, in, in many years. Suspension, and even with the suspension being up, he hasn't been signed or invited to a different team. So it is apples and oranges in a way, but I don't understand how the guy that just got left, let go, and in, in Rick Hahn, is saying that this was a calculated risk. And the White Sox are saying that when they first signed him, they didn't know about this allegation. It was still confidential. So when they signed him to a $12 million deal, like there is kind of some culpability or there's some kind of like you could throw your hands up in the air and it's like, well, what are you going to do? You already signed him to a $12 million deal. Let him play out the year. I think the biggest slap in the face and I think the biggest, most disgusting thing from Chris Getz is the fact that, A, if you were going to make this signing and he was such a good clubhouse guy, why did you let him go explore the free agent market? And maybe it's because he wanted to see what it was like, but... At some point, how do you not get this guy into camp for spring training to help out the major league club? Because we're still wondering who this fifth starter is going to be. It's sloppy because, A, I don't like the guy. I don't like him because of the person that he is, not the pitcher. He can have a 377 ERA. Great that he went 9 to 9. I don't care. I don't like the guy. The guy that was the former GM was calling it a calculated risk. I still feel like it is a calculated risk. Unless the White Sox learned so much about Michael Clevenger in those. 24 games that he was in the clubhouse for the White Sox last year, more than 24 games, made 24 starts. Um, but I, I don't know. That's it's 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 just frustrating because he was still seen as a calculated risk last year. Maybe he has gone through the the growth and the the therapy that was recommended by Major League Baseball, and he has become a better person. But I I really am going to be interested in to see how Chris gets explains this because it's it's extremely frustrating as a fan. That's for sure. Um, we got one super chat from Edward saying, you guys deserve my money more than the white suck. So we appreciate that. Uh, any other things from the ball club or ballpark Vinny, uh, that we want to add on? 
Uh, no, I think we're going to be, uh, you know, it's just going to be an interesting couple of days here in terms of those roster moves that we were talking about, right? It, how long is Aloy going to be out? Who is going to be the fifth starter? But are they going to play the next two days? I think the forecast is very poor on both of those days. So uh, a night game scheduled for tomorrow and a day game scheduled for Wednesday when it's supposed to snow. So uh, I, I think we're just going to have to wait and find out when the next White Sox game is going to be and therefore what the what the roster needs are going to be at come that, that day. Um, one thing, too, I wanted to get uh, just re- going through your Twitter feed. Uh, did Flexen talk about the – incident in the fourth inning where the umps came out and talked about what was on his leg he did not we talked to pedro uh, about it first and so i think pedro's explanation probably kind of superseded because he just said it was nothing and it was absolutely nothing he said they saw it the white Sox did in the first inning and they wouldn't have you know sent him out there or let it continue had it been uh not not able to to be allowed so um the the umps obviously looked at it they, they probably got, I don't know if they got word from the Braves to look at it or not, or they did it on their own, but they signaled, you saw the signal back to the Braves dugout saying it's okay. So um, listen, that's a, a good job, I guess, by the umpires. You're supposed to look into those kind of things and make sure that none of that's going on. They looked into it and nothing was going on. All right. Uh, we got one more final super chat from gaming, gaming from the gaming for veterans, a $20 super chat. Thank you very much. How do we feel that Robert has been going around telling the media how much he has put uh, how much work he's put in this season, and then he goes 0 for 8 in the last two games with 7 Ks. Can someone in this organization please take ownership? Thank you for the super chat. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I liked what I heard on Saturday from him. He hit two monster home runs. Baseball's difficult from what we know. I don't know if we could just chug it up to going 0 for 8, just being baseball being difficult. We talked about him struggling at the plate today, looking late on fastballs. Maybe tomorrow he just goes out and hits two monster homers. Like I, I'm not worried about Luis Robert Jr. We heard we heard a lot about this actually pregame from Pedro Grafol. If you'll remember back to yesterday, Luis Robert Jr. was called out three times, looking uh, on a day where the strike zone was very, uh, let's say, long. Uh, and uh, the I believe all three times, if you look at the game cast at least. The, that pitch, strike three, is below the strike zone. And so Pedro Grafol actually complimented Luis Robert Jr. for taking those pitches today, saying, listen, you know, he, there's nothing wrong with him trying to have a better understanding of the strike zone. If he were to just swing and miss at him, which then he did four times today, and, uh, you know, and, and just kind of let it fly, that's what you don't want to see because that means he's getting out of the strike zone. He's expanding it. He's, he's swinging it at balls. Yesterday, he didn't swing at balls, and they thought that worth complimenting, actually. So I think that yesterday was a unique situation in which – this is probably a guy who would have walked three times under a different umpire. Remember, we always got to remind, we always got to remind that the rule is the umpire sets the strike zone. It's not a fixed one. I, I just find that so weird. But the uh, the idea that today maybe would have been the more concerning performance because he was swinging and missing and swinging through pitches, whereas yesterday you could have seen that, and, and Pedro described it as a sign of patience and a sign of understanding that strike zone in a better way than we've seen from Luis in the past. I think I said six whiffs uh, for Robert today on 12 swings. Uh, This chart's only showing five of them. Uh, But there was one that was barely outside of the strike zone, two that were completely inside of the strike zone that they're forcing fastballs. Usually he hits those. So I'm not too worried about those two. And then, you know, Charlie Morton's got a nasty curveball. He got him swinging on two of those. Like overall, especially with what you just brought in, seeing how he looks on Sunday, he does look extremely more composed and this is a guy uh, James Fegan threw this out on the Sox machine yesterday this is a guy that usually has a chase rate of 40 percent and before today it was 17 so if he's got a chase rate of 17 just let him play I don't know 159 more games and he'll probably be pretty decent and bounce back but appreciate uh that uh the super chat and 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 for the uh the comment there yeah and I think that yesterday's calls are produced today's results he was patient. He did what he was doing in the offseason, the work that he did put in there, and he didn't get rewarded for it. He could have walked a couple times there where he should have walked. And that umpire, if you look at up scorecards, he was one of the worst. He had a terrible day behind the plate where he's calling, what, seven balls strikes, which is really high for an umpire to do that during a whole game. And I think today some of these swings are okay, they're going to call strikes on pitches that are I know are balls. Maybe I need to expand my strike zone a little bit. And also, 
I'm the guy who provides offense for this team. As we've seen, the six-run game was his two-home run game. And then when he doesn't hit a home run, zero, two, and zero. So he's like, probably the pressure is like, okay, I have to do big things for this team to score runs. So I'm going to expand my strike zone a little bit and try to get some runs on the board via myself, even though I know those pitches are way out of the zone that I need to be in. My favorite stat from yesterday, or uh, my favorite stat from last year, uh, Luis Robert Jr.'s solo home runs would have also led the White Sox. He led the team in home runs with 38, and then I think he hit 27 solo shots, and that also would have led the team. So very fun uh, stats there from the 2023 White Sox. Anything else, Vinny? People should go check out your uh, diehard uh, newsletter if they haven't yet, and obviously sign up to be a diehard today if you're not at allchgo.com. But anything else, Ben, before we uh, get you out of here? No, it's still raining. All right. Well, hey, <laughs> good, good thing they didn't play that ninth inning. I, I, you know, I know the White Sox could have had a chance, but I, I think it was the right call to uh, to bang that game. I sure right. hope they bang the game for tomorrow early enough for us to you know know and so Vinny doesn't have to drive down there early as hell too. Or let's just play a game. Let's just play a game in the middle of the day. Who cares? Hey, I'm Come down. Is, we don't need to cancel games. They have to. Games. They have to get these games in. Atlanta doesn't come back to Chicago only one more time, but that's in the middle of May, and they're got no day game or no uh, off days in between. So they got to play these games some way, somehow. Maybe in the October, like after the regular season's over, the White Sox are way eliminated, and the Braves are playing for like. Best record in the NL. Hey. They got to come back here to Chicago and beat the White Sox real quick. How long does it pl- to play to take six innings, or how long does it play to <laughs> six innings with a pitch clock? I mean, what you could probably and get the that White done Sox, in an hour and a half. I'm gonna say, and the White Sox not hitting, probably an hour. There you go. Uh, all right, that's Vinny Duber, our CHGO White Sox beat writer. Follow him at Vinny Duber uh, on Twitter. That's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him at Eckerwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. You can follow the show at CHGO underscore White Sox. And thank you to Sarah for producing the show. We appreciate everyone for hanging out with us today got 78 likes which hey you know that's important for the white Sox. you know the 78 the new home one of the uh, best years of ever in the history of ever but hey maybe maybe we get up to 88 a little Luis robert jr number i wouldn't hate that so uh, hit that thumbs up button hit that subscribe button we'll talk to you tomorrow whether there is or isn't a game took away one of our likes no it's chris flexen likes oh Ooh. <laughs> jerks bye bye we all silly like the mayor. 